After presenting my photographic work to a client and business had been concluded, he said, I will scream next time I am presented with a portfolio of images taken before ten and after four of the Lake District or Yorkshire Dales. He was not, of course, talking about my presentation, but the benighted perception when many landscape photographs should be taken. Do they go to bed between ten and four, he said. I want to view images taken throughout daylight hours, and furthermore, not in national parks. I can access them very easily. I think that my client had just experienced a bad day. But uh, don't get me wrong, I love taking photographs early morning and late evening. But let's turn matters on its head. And just for fun, this show features landscape photographs taken between 10 and 4 only. But I will include a few taken in a national park. I am showing them in time order, irrespective of date. A general observation first. During December and January, you have a quality of light similar to the so-called golden hour for most of the day, and around the equinox, the angle of daylight is approximately at 45 degrees. This adds modelling not present at other times of the year. Much of my commercial photography demands strong colours, having a clarity of light, but not with too many heavy shadows. Also, I am not averse to getting myself thoroughly wet in the pursuance of my art. It might not look obvious, but there is a considerable dynamic range in this shot between sky and foreground. To avoid overexposure of the sky, I spot meter it and lighten foreground in laterum. I often travel by train, especially to Scotland, but on something a bit faster than this. But I love to photograph these heritage railways, reveling in their history and romance. Now, October in Scotland is fabulous and not just for autumn colours, but the moodiness of light at any time of day. High ground featuring mountains photograph much better than pastoral landscapes in winter. Their contours respond more dramatically to the low light. A sunless day is best for balancing the exposure between an interior and a much brighter exterior. Spot meter each half, and the difference in exposure is quite surprising. Now, I meter for highlights. This business of exposing to the right is, for me, benighted nonsense. It is as if somebody, someone, made a suggestion, and everyone else followed like sheep without checking. Reminds me of an aria by Handel in The Messiah. And we like sheep. Oh, never mind. No, that is not dust on my sensor. It is snow. Olympus solved that problem back in 2003 with the release of the E1. Exposing to the right would make a mockery of this image because we still need to see detail in the sunlit roof. The same is true of this image, taken on the North Downs. Even when underexposed, bringing down the high-key distant view was not easy. Exposing to the left is not without its own problems. Added noise when lightening shadows. So you are caught both ways. And I find HDR verging on the artificial. Lightroom offers more control and an escape route. This shot had me on my toes. Not only did I have to expose to the left for the penetrating highlight, it was scudding up the lock much quicker than an express train, and you never quite knew where it would go. I had to hand hold, but 
as the shutter speed was an eight hundredth of a second at f8, that wasn't a problem. The same is true with this photo. You want to see as much detail in the cloud as possible, but fortunately the weather was much more static, and here too at Birkenhead. It is so benign that we have a subtle reflection making something out of a large sheet of water that on a more mobile day would be simply uninteresting. Controlling highlights here was once more the name of the game, as we want to see detail in those clouds. We don't want them to burn out to pure white. I was happy to leave the land almost in silhouette, something I controlled in Lightroom, and that can be altered later if I change my mind. I avoid doing things in camera that cannot be undone as much as possible. Highlight control is again very much in evidence at Keld to ensure that we can see every detail in the stonework of the buildings. After all, I want to give the builder due recognition by presenting his skills to the best advantage, and the same is true with this selection of high dynamic images, where any blown out highlights that can't be corrected would simply ruin the photographs. This landscape would appear technically undemanding, but by including the sky in a composition that is partly in shadow, now that can easily become overexposed either to a white or the clouds looking overcooked when corrected. By exposing to the left and gently lightening shadows in Lightroom, I have preserved the vibrancy of the scene that attracted my eye in the first place. Another challenging shot. It was freezing cold, not a place to hang about. Those clouds are moving fast, and the positioning of the cloud burst highlight is important. I took several quick shots with varying degrees of success. Not a place to fanny about. Just take it and move on. And thankfully, Liz's car wasn't far away. Things were calmer in Gloucestershire. The light utterly different, demonstrating its importance in landscape photography. Compositionally, it shows the significance of layers, and there are several, and each one not having too much of the same thing, though, having said that, the sky is in danger of that, but fortunately it is quite interesting. Although a beautiful, crisp, sunny day, bringing out every detail in a landscape, the low light just within my self-imposed time frame adds a touch of atmosphere and mystery. That was certainly available in my last shot, here in Scotland, where rainbows tend to be to a penny. Again, you need the right sort of weather, and I do tire of other photographers who add them with a filter or in a computer. If that was the case for me, I would deserve to be dismissed as a fraud, and of course, just to bring matters home, I give you two for the price of one.